Ladies and gentlemen, it would be very kind if you could all please move towards the stage. So if there is an empty row, an empty seat in front and or ahead of you, please fill that immediately. Thank you very much. As long as you don't sit in this row in front, that would also be very kind. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your collaboration, for your cooperation, for your indulgence. So apart from that row, the second row would also indicate that it's off limits. The row in which the Minister of Fisheries and Marine Resources is seated in at the present moment. So those two are off limits. I still see some of you folks. Mr. Hay, I would like you to please lead by example. Please just move forward as far as you can. I do not want to reveal your identity and mention those, those names. But please, we don't have time, so please do that. Are we doing it? I would like to ask you to please remain standing as you are able for the singing of the national and the African Union anthems. Thank you very much. You may be seated.
Right Honorable Prime Minister Sara Kongawa Amadila, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Namibia. Honorable Tom Alvendo, the Minister of Mines and Energy. Honorable Derek Larson, the Minister of Fisheries and Marine Resources. Honorable Cornelia Shilunga, Deputy Minister of Mines and Energy. Her Worship the Mayor of Vintuk, Councillor Sade Gavanas. His Worship, Councillor Trevino Forbes, Mayor of Warpers Bay. Mr. Jason Kasutu, the Chairperson of the Economic Association of Namibia. Ms. Nangula Wanja, the Chief Executive Officer and Chairperson of the Namibia Investment Promotion and Development Board. Dr. Clemens von Dodere, the resident representative of the Hans Seidel Foundation in Namibia. Mr. James Newpe, the Presidential Economic Advisor and Namibia's Green Hydrogen Commissioner. Your Excellencies, Heads of Mission to Namibia, fellow critical thinkers and practitioners of excellence, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning and a warm welcome to day two and the final day of the Namibia National Green Hydrogen Conference 2022. My name is Denver Vikisting. It's a great delight and a huge honor to be in your company again today. Yesterday, of course, set the scene, started the critically important conversation, and today our intention is that we are going to elevate that conversation. My conviction is the deliberations will once again be fruitful, and by the end of this day, we will have a clear path and picture of the way forward. To remind us about the day that's gone and to help us reflect on its successes, but also to see to that that we don't dwell and delve and linger too much in the past because we need to remain forward thinking. We need to remain progressive. I would like to share the following quotation attributed to none other than Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And it reads as follows. Nothing is worth more than this day. You cannot relive yesterday. Tomorrow is still beyond your reach. For purposes of emphasis, I will take the liberty to repeat that. And I'd like you to listen attentively. Nothing is worth more than this day. You cannot relive yesterday, and tomorrow is still beyond your reach. The house rules, as established yesterday, remain the same. There is a call on the part of the organizers that if we need to excuse ourselves for whatever valid reason, and we find ourselves in the corridors or elsewhere, that we do not have a separate conference. We have one meeting, we have one conversation, so we, I'd like to appeal to you to please honor that throughout. If there are challenges with the device, we will deal with it as it unfolds, but green means going forward, and red means going backwards. So just bear that in mind as well. We'd like to appeal to all the speakers, all the moderators, all the panelists, to please again honor the very precious resource of time. Um, I brought along a different color tie that is of a color that I mentioned not too long ago. I don't want to be tempted to go put on that tie today, but I certainly will not hesitate if the time arrives for, for that. Um, we're very happy and delighted for the high level and executive buy-in and support of political will as demonstrated by the presence of the Prime Minister today at this event. And I'd like us to, in advance, give the Prime Minister, give ourselves, and, and give this country and her people a beautiful, warm, and gracious round of applause. <laughs> to kickstart the proceedings for today, I'd now like to call on Dr. Clemens von Dodere, the resident representative of the Hans Seidel Foundation in Namibia, 
for some welcome remarks, but perhaps also for a brief reflection on day one. I love Dr. Van Doerder's commitment to brevity. Doctor, the floor is yours. A round of applause, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, honorable, right honorable prime minister, honorable ministers. Uh, allow me to uh, work on the protocol as established, um, also in the essence of time. Yesterday we had very fruitful elaborations and um, that sometimes uh, was at the detriment of time. So uh, allow me to um, avoid uh, a lengthy welcoming once again. I think uh, Denver did already an outstanding job on that one. Um, so thank you very much. Um, so all protocols observed. Um, yesterday was indeed a very exciting and fruitful and successful day, as we all, the organizers, believe. Um, we had four key sessions. One was on uh, Namibia, a key player in the new market. The second one was on green hydrogen fundamentals. The third one was on legal and regulatory framework. And the last one for day one was on the economics of green hydrogen and the global decarbonization. And one of the things is, um, I think, which, which really sort of uh, trickled down at the end of the day was that we have four future enabling elements. The one is what we, needed to, we need to address. The one is the regulatory framework. The second one is infrastructure, the supply industry, and in terms of human resources, the available trained specialists. We have to establish a new ecosystem, including a regulatory framework, but it is important for that one to, use to, to, to take time and to follow democratic procedures. There's a risk, obviously, with establishing a new industry like the green hydrogen industry, especially also from a human resource point of view. We might be pirating on other industries setting up this new industry. So, there's a lot of effort needed now, to, and action re required now, to move forward and to make sure that we are ready when the systems are here, that we have the structures in place, and that we can move forward to create a better future for Namibia. Jason Kasutu uh, uh, highlighted very importantly yesterday that while many other countries have to deal with significant pollution, our pollution is poverty and hunger. And the green hydrogen industry, this new ecosystem, allows us maybe to tackle this very issue, to remove poverty and hunger. And I must say I'm very excited to be part of this, to see this unfolding, and I think we all can agree that we will put our hands together, uh, roll up our sleeves to make sure that indeed this becomes a success story. Namibia has an opportunity to become an important energy player um, to supply uh, the world with a highly needed renewable resource of energy. But obviously, we'll have to do our homework to get that right. Challenges also around that is that it is a totally new market. It's the magnitude of this development is something unheard of. We haven't seen in Namibia yet. But we have the right people in place, um, and we'll get... Uh, in those places where we don't have them yet, I'm sure we'll make a plan to have them trained, to have them educated, and if there's a lack still on some, some places, we will get support from outside. We need a sound and conducive policy framework, um, one of the lessons we've learned in session four, and we need to also focus, obviously, on the impact on the communities on the ground, but also the environment as has been alluded also in the last session um, by uh, the CEO of Hyphen, um, which, who emphasized that the greatest importance is obviously the environmental impact. In the south of Luderitz, we all know the Spergebiet is a highly sensitive ecosystem and that needs to be taken care of and addressed. And so one thing we pride ourselves here in Namibia is obviously the um, in ecosystem or the environment we have, uh, one of the greatest assets we can um, present to the world. I'm looking forward to today's elaborations as well, and I look forward to the uh, report we will have um, following this conference, and I'm sure it will shed more light to some of the questions and challenges we face, 
but also solutions and opportunities which present through this new ecosystem we will see. With that, allow me to conclude. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I look forward to today too. And thank you for all of you for being part of this, to be here at this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. von Dürere. Please give him another round of applause. As per the directive of the head of state, His Excellency, Dr. Hage Kengup, no one should feel left out. Allow me to also welcome those tuned in on all the virtual platforms. We're happy to have you as part of this critically important conversation, as part of this plan, this ambition to bring about economic emancipation for Namibians. Allow me to, in that same regard, I've been informed in the meantime that Honorable Pamba Shifeta, the Minister of Environment, Forestry and Tourism is also in our midst. Welcome to you too, Honorable Minister. We're also happy to have you. <laughs> Conversations as we established yesterday and as we know in general about Namibians set the scene, set the pace and ultimately also set the bar, hopefully very high, to help us influence policy, to help us chart the way, to help us accomplish our goals. It's through constructive, through lively, through rigorous discourse that we get to tackle our challenges, that we get to deal with our pollution, as Mr. Jason Kasutu, the chair of uh, the Economic Association of Namibia yesterday said, relating to poverty, inequality and unemployment that we get to the point that we need to get to to start moving, to start implementing. My de facto mentor, a wordsmith par excellence, a man who knows not only the trade of words, but is also a super efficient human being, and is in fact one of the key drivers behind the success of this conference. And I'm sure he doesn't appreciate this part of the introduction, but it's fine, I've got the floor right now. He goes by the name of Ricardo Nguajosep. He'll be leading a high-level conversation shortly between His Excellency, Mr. Herbert Beck, the German ambassador, ambassador to Namibia, with whom I had a powerful conversation this morning about the collaboration between the Federal Republic of Germany and the Republic of Namibia, in as far as, of course, it relates to green hydrogen, what it is that we can learn from one another, how the skills exchange will work to make sure that we not only import the skills, that we not only import the capital, that, but we transfer the skills and we ultimately empower Namibians. So apart from the German ambassador to Namibia, His Excellency Herbert Beck, the second very important participant of this conversation is Honorable Cornelia Shilunga, the Deputy Minister of Mines and Energy. So put your hands together for Mr. Ricardo Juajosep. I think the man deserves a bigger round of applause. <laughs> I don't know who will uh, stop Denver, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm very humble. Thank you very much, uh, Denver, for that uh, introduction. I think just to start off and set, set the pace, um, I really just want to inform all our international guests that are here today that uh, you see the procession of the names of the leaders that we mentioned here. The Prime Minister is here. We have three uh, cabinet ministers here. We have a deputy minister here. Uh, we have uh, mayors present here. It is not something out of the ordinary. That is the kind of support that the leadership, the political leadership of this country provide in all sectors of our country. If there's an important conversation, they show up. Can we please just give them a warm round of applause for that? <clears throat> The relationship between Namibia and Germany can be characterized by, uh, I think I'll use my own example when I was growing up. You know, my sister is about five years older than me. So when we were kids, when we were younger, she always used to bully me. So I was a small guy, she was taller than me, and then I always used to listen to her until I grew up and had my growth spurt. And then at some stage I had to tell her, okay, enough now. 
We are equals now. So that's the relationship that we're having right now. We are sitting on equal footing and having that conversation. That's why I'm so excited to have that. A round of applause, please. 32 years, we are grown-ups now. We are adults. But nonetheless, let's get to the important meat for the day. The focus today is on economic development. That's what we're going to be focusing on in terms of this conversation. Please allow me to welcome the Honorable Deputy Minister to come and give us uh, a few words uh, before we get into the conversation with His Excellency Herbert Bay. Please, can I also ask His Excellency to come to the stage so that once the Honorable Deputy Minister is done, we can get right into our conversation for today. We'll, of course, also give a platform to you. Director of Ceremonies, Right Honorable Saraku Wongerwa Amadira, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Namibia, my Minister Honorable Tom Arwendo, Minister of Mines and Energy, Honorable Bamba Shifeta, the Minister of Environment and Tourism, Honorable Derek Klassen, the Minister of Fisheries and Marine Resources. Your Excellency and my partner this morning, Herbert Beck, the German Ambassador, Menangula Wanja, the Chief Executive Officer of the Namibian Investment Promotion Board, let me stand by the protocols as established by the Director of Ceremonies. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's such an honor to be part of this very impactful and constructive deliberations marking the inaugural Namibian Green Hydrogen Conference as hosted by NIPDB, partnering with Economic Association of Namibia and the Hans Seidel Foundation. This has brought us together as stakeholders to share notes on our collective vision to ensure sustainable, inclusive economic growth. Allow me to say the conversation on green hydrogen is one that has taken the nation by storm. And with all the attention now upon us, we must now be deliberate, twice as committed, and be hungry for results so we can enhance the economic recovery of our nation. We have now arrived at a point where we have to ask ourselves whether we want to be part of the green energy revolution sweeping across the world, one in which cleaner sources of energy are slowly but surely replacing fossil fuel. Thus, we must all harness the power of abundance of our natural resources to the fullest extent possible for the energy transition. Green hydrogen is produced through renewable sources such as solar and wind and holds a significant massive promise in meeting the world's future energy needs, if not demands. Namibia is blessed with solar, strong wind energy sources, vast land, geographical position, and good international relations and trade, which gives us a competitive advantage. Therefore, in that light, Namibia is a growing hub when it comes to the generation of renewable energy. In the, the in abundance wind and solar power resources enable us to be at the forefront of green hydrogen development and progress towards greater energy independence. Our potential for, scale, for scaling up energy, scaling up a green hydrogen industry is massive, and we have the right ingredients. We further boast 3,500 hours of sunshine annually, and I am reliably informed that this is a double to what German has to offer. In the meantime, Experts 
at PricewaterhouseCoopers have proactively set themselves to the noble task of analyzing the green hydrogen market right across the world and have equally identified the potential demand for growth. These results are important to us as policymakers as they provide guidance on how the future market for green hydrogen could evolve. Right Honorable Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to thank His Excellency the President of the Republic of Namibia, Dr. Hage Kainkob, for his visionary leadership of presiding the future and aligning our country along the path where we are destined to reap the fruits of the efforts of today. The colossal effort is witnessed today by how His Excellency was able to put up together a team of progressive experts, policymakers, and leading industry players who have dared to dream and set the task of transforming Namibia into a green hydrogen hub. My task is to highlight the importance of international cooperation and in creating government and private sector-led synergies in order to marshal the much-needed combined efforts, which is the key to unlocking the fullest potential of our natural resources. Green hydrogen for Namibia marks a new beginning, and our national aspirations are very, very clear. We need to create jobs, we need assets, we need capacity, both in terms of human capital and skill transfers. We also need to have, a good, to have good policies and markets for our products and continuous research and development. We will not be able to achieve all this without proper infrastructure, sound financing systems, investment opportunities created in the green hydrogen industry at all levels of our economy and our trade. It must be understood that every Namibian has got a role to play, be it our local communities, our learners and students, our traditional authorities, our businesses, be it large or small and medium enterprises, every one of us. We also know that green hydrogen fuels all sectors, such as transport, steel, agriculture, clean energy, and many others. What I have just mentioned now demands networking, demands coordination and cooperation. This smart partnership has come with commendable stakeholders and investor engagement so that the green hydrogen project does not remain a government responsibility alone, but one which must bring together all parties from within and outside our borders. International and multilateral cooperation is the key to clear hydrogen industry and economy, and as policymakers and industry stakeholders, we need to collaborate and work hard in order to integrate the effects of global warming, recover our economies, and improve the livelihoods of our people. Government need to set rules and create a conducive policy environment in which public and private sector can be empowered to accelerate green hydrogen deployment. On the other hand, players in the industry, be it suppliers, utility companies, transport manufacturers, also need to play their part to continue developing and supply the appropriate technologies. Collaboration between public and private plays a major role in turning the hydrogen industry into really catalyst for the energy transition. No country can play it solo in dealing with global issues and problems, whether it is the industry or government. For us to deal with global problems, we need global solutions. Private sectors need to mobilize capital to bring about products, new technology, and financing. On our side as government, 
We continue to level the regulatory system that is creating the demand for investment and enhance attraction, decrease tariffs and costs that are associated with green hydrogen production and distribution. Right Honorable Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, cooperation works and inspires action. Already, Namibia has made some cooperation initiatives. Since our first request for proposals to conduct a feasibility study on the Green Hydrogen Project, Namibia has formed a strong partnership with Germany, Belgium, Qatar, the Netherlands, and soon to sign a memorandum of understanding with the European Union by COP27. This signifies our deliberate intentions to develop our green hydrogen sector through cooperations. Through this cooperation, the government of the Netherlands is funding a study on the port expansion master plan, a study that is being conducted by our own port, Namport, and the port of Rotterdam. I must also comment through the ambassador here, the German Federal Research Ministry for availing grant funding towards the acceleration of Namibia's green hydrogen ambitions. This grant funding has resulted in two pilot projects that were launched yesterday with the idea of starting to build a local hydrogen industry and not just an export-oriented project. The funding will also take care of the crafting of Namibia's national green hydrogen strategy and roadmap that is being done by Mackenzie. Further, that same funding has made provision for scholarships that we are busy evaluating currently. In the same vein, I would also like to commend my minister, Honorable Toma Rendo, and the minister, Robert Abbott, Minister of Economic Affairs and Climate Action of the Federal Republic of, of Germany, through you, uh, Ambassador, who have managed to sign a joint declaration of intent that looks to strengthen cooperation in the field of green hydrogen and associated synthetic fuels. This joint declaration will see Germany private companies offering off-take security for our green hydrogen molecules. This alone demonst is demonstrative of the fact that our green hydrogen project is massive in scale, broader in scope, and long-lasting in its economic impact. As part of our drive to forge smart synergies with other players and, of course, on other cooperations, His Excellency the President has discussed with the former Chinese ambassador to Namibia, Zhang Qiming, the possibility of new cooperations. This will include Chinese state-owned enterprises with the latest technology in green hydrogen to come and invest or partner with Namibian companies. To participate in the Green Hydrogen Project. Equally, we have looked to Saudi Arabia and the presidency this year already hosted a delegation at the back of massive interest from investors to be part of Namibia's success story on the frontier of clean energy. All these efforts, ladies and gentlemen, are testimony to the desire Namibia shares for putting in place the right technologies which will lay the foundations for the manifestation of our green hydrogen hub vision. There is a need to bring about complementary engines of economic growth while at the same time highlighting the significance of a green economy that attracts sustainable investment. We live and work in a complex ecosystem which needs the whole supply chain to work together. And speak 
the same language, from policies to incentives to technologies to capital until when civil society access the innovations at a reasonable tariff. As I conclude, right honorable prime minister, may I, I, I reiterate the message that Namibia has now arrived on the scene and is ready to do business with those that share our visions of a safer, greener, and sustainable future society that benchmarks its successes on gross domestic happiness more than pure gross domestic products. With this said, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to say, may this course that we have chartered for ourselves lead us into new horizons and cooperations which allow Namibia to be a greater leader on innovation and energy provision for a fast shifting world. And through the ambassador here, I would like us as Namibians to really register our profound gratitude and appreciation to the cooperation that we have so far and that we are looking forward to more and more cooperations. Are we green? Are we hydrogen? We are green hydrogen. Thank you. Uh, Denver, please allow me to stand. I know that you want us all to sit. Uh, the, the perspective shared by the Honorable Deputy Minister really puts the conversation uh, in, a, in a very, very broad light. And I'm glad that you highlighted some of the projects that we're going to be working on. But I wanted uh, Your Excellency to quickly come in here and set the tone, of course, from your side. We know that globally right now, in as far as the plans that we've had for globalization, COVID has really disrupted that and tested a lot of relationships in terms of international co co uh, cooperation. Can you perhaps just reflect on the new approach that we need to take or how do we tighten some of these cracked relationships now due to the economic turmoil that we're experiencing globally? Um, thank you very much for that um, interesting question. Um, well, I think um, we have to deal with COVID. It's a new factor in uh, world politics, but I think we also have managed in the past two years to find new ways of collaboration. I mean, video conferencing is not ideal, and uh, I'm very glad also that we have the opportunity to meet here and uh, to exchange uh, our views and our positions uh, directly. And uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, very necessary, but I think uh, we, um, we can live with disruptions like um, like uh, COVID, um, and I think we also have to deal with disruptions like uh, the uh, attack of Russia on Ukraine, which uh, has uh, brought uh, to us, at least in Europe, a new dimension of uh, replacing uh, gas um, um, and uh, traditional fossil fuel gas with uh, green hydrogen. So I think the pressure on uh, alternatives is even bigger now than it has been like uh, six months uh, ago. Mm. Uh, Honorable Shilunga, in terms of the support we're receiving from uh, Germany from an economic uh, cooperation perspective, uh, what makes this relationship unique that Namibia has with Germany compared to obviously most of the other countries? We know Namibia is a friend to all, we're non aligned. Uh, but what gives provide this that confidence for them to be able to sit on platforms like this and be part of that long-term economic development plan of Namibia? Uh, thank you very much. Um, the cooperation between Namibia and Germany is not only starting now, it has started long before. And uh, we have um, many Germans among us. And uh, in Namibia, we speak German. And uh, we share a lot when it comes to the German culture. Uh, we, in our schools, we also have got the uh, German as, as, as a language. And that makes it very unique uh, as uh, Namibia and German because we have such a, a, a relationship 
that has started long ago and that has made Namibia and Germany to be, uh, um, to be related in such a way that no country can really compete with Germany when it comes to the relationship with Namibia. It, of course, yes. And um, with the support that we are getting from them, we, as I have alluded to earlier, that we really um, uh, appreciate that support. And they, Germany is not only offering support to Namibia in terms of uh, the green hydrogen. They have been at the forefront long time. During the liberation struggle, we, we benefited so much from Germany. We even had our own children that were based in Germany. And uh, uh, on a lighter note, I would share that uh, I remember when the kids came back, one of the child was saying, I live German, I stay German, I am German, I can't stay in Namibia. And that is how we are related with German. Thank you so much. Mm. Your Excellency, focusing a little bit now on the green hydrogen question, what would you classify as the success of green hydrogen uh, for Germany? Well, it's not a success, it's a necessity. Mm. I think, um, I mean, looking at the, at the world and looking at uh, um, the industrialized, um, we, we are polluting the world in a way also that um, we, are, we cannot continue like that bef uh, as, as before. I mean, Paris is, so to speak, the... Uh, the the um, the point also where the uh, um, the world community agreed to limit uh, uh, global warming to uh, at least uh, two uh, two degrees maybe 1.5 degrees and that needs action so uh, now we are in a in the situation to decarbonize our industries to to de decarbonize our lives uh, in in many respects and. Uh, and it's clear also that, it, uh, that a country like Germany, which is the third largest uh, economy in the world, uh, has to lead that process and has to find solutions with partners who can uh, uh, contribute to that. And, uh, and I think what happened in the last uh, 12, 18 months in Namibia is something uh, I think it's, it's absolutely extraordinary that, uh, that people come together, that uh, the leader, under the leadership of His Excellency the President uh, and, uh, and his cabinet, um, that uh, rules were established to uh, create uh, this uh, green hydrogen hub. And, um, and I mean, if you talk to anybody here in, uh, around the, uh, this room and outside to say, you know, like, uh, would you think that Namibia is going to be a leader in green hydrogen uh, technology pr uh, or, or production uh, in, in the years to come? I think uh, you had a very small um, uh, consensus rate in, in, uh, in at that time. Nowadays, it has changed dramatically and, and, and fundamentally. And, uh, and I think uh, now the task is really to, uh, to bring about it. And, uh, so. It's an important point that you're making on the consensus. I think the concern also from, especially from a lot of Namibians was, is this a long-term pipe dream? Is there really such high demand for downstream for green hydrogen? Well, I think uh, if, you, if you look at the, um, at the experts, um, 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 how you say, forecasts, um, I think now we are producing like 90 million tons of uh, hydrogen, gray hydrogen, uh, per year uh, worldwide. And the need for uh, green hydrogen in 2050 is maybe about 500 to 600 million tons. So, so it, it's uh, like four or five fold what we are producing now. And uh, I think it, it's a clear indication also that, um, that we need all the green hydrogen we can produce. Of course, that is not uh, limited to Namibia, which has uh, maybe the best or among the best preconditions also to produce it, but it's, it's of course also left to, to countries like Germany to produce its own uh, green hydrogen. No, but only uh, the fact is that uh, for a developing price, we don't have a price for green hydrogen at this moment. We have to develop the market, we have to create a, a world uh, um, um, world market for green hydrogen, uh, but uh, that will be a thing of the of the future. But uh, we all know also that we cannot stay and drag our feet, but we have to move forward. And uh, and I think it's great to see that Namibia 
uh, is, um, is moving forward. And I think uh, the Honorable Tom Alvendo, when he went to Germany in March, I think he, uh, he experienced uh, this uh, seriousness and, uh, and also the interest of Germany as a, as a country and uh, to, to move forward together with Namibia. And let me just say one thing. Uh, I think government and governments is one side also, but I think one has to underscore that this is the private sector which has to bring it about. So I think all the conditions also needed for good investments in Namibia which, um, which fulfills political aims, that is clear, but I think the private sector and the conditions under which a private sector is really prepared to invest into Namibia is very, very important. Thank you. I've got a question coming up for that one, that, that, that relationship with the private sector. But Honorable Shilunga, you mentioned a little bit earlier, of course, that there was, uh, that the pilot project was launched. We had a uh, big <coughs> check also on stage here yesterday. But the big question is, are there off-takers already for what the uh, pilot projects are going to produce? Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, one thing uh, one must think about when the off-takers are seems not to be ready, mm. when uh, there is no demand, demand is created. And it all depends on the strategies that we are going to implement to make sure that we have as enough off-takers as possible. Of course, uh, in, on the cooperations that I have just alluded to, uh, for Germany, Qatar, Belgium, and the Netherlands, we already have some that have indicated that they are interested in the, in the, in the, in the off-taking um, uh, agreements to happen. And also on the uh, business delegations that we are engaging. And as, also, as we engage with international communities, we market ourselves as Namibia. We market the green hydrogen. I know for sure now each and every country in the world knows about Namibia because of the green hydrogen. And now and then at the ministry, my minister can testify to that, we receive so many investors that are interested in partaking into the green hydrogen uh, uh, projects. Therefore, off-takers, of course, will be there. We will make sure that if they are not interested, we make them, interest, we make them interested. <laughs> the, in, in terms of that, still staying with the private sector, of course, a corporation, Your Excellency, how do we ensure, because we know, of course, that from a government perspective, the priority is the people. There's a social uh, a mandate. But for private business, the aim is profit. How do, we, how do you come to the party? How do you get... Uh, that, that, that relationship with private sector so that you make sure that both needs are met at the end of the day once the projects are finalized? I think the Green Hydrogen Project is probably um, an example where the definition of profit is uh, maybe a bit, um, has to be differ differentiated. Mm -hmm. So uh, <clears throat> I think there's short-term profit and there is long-term profit. And I think the green hydrogen uh, area is not for short-term profits, it's for long-term profits. Um, and um, and uh, a, a project like uh, Hyphen also is, uh, I think the layout is for 40 years. That means also that uh, banks are not able and not willing also to fund such a huge investment or if they are not sure that this um, enterprise is going to live for 40 years in order to get back their money and uh, some, some um, interest as well. So I, I guess it's, uh, it's clear also that a long-term investment needs other areas and other aspects to be, um, to be covered than just, let's say, a, a quick buck. And, um, and I think there we as, uh, as Germany and we, I think we are not into the quick buck um, industry anyway. Um, and I think we understand that, uh, and I think also the private sector understands that this is more than just producing green hydrogen in Namibia. It is a project to bring people in Namibia 
to a other, to a different level to address the the question of unemployment uh, un inequality uh, and in this country to combat uh, hunger and uh, to find jobs for people uh, to uh, um, to address those uh, those issues and uh, so I'm confident also that green hydrogen is not um, a short-term thing, but it is something which takes into consideration those aspects as well. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. In conclusion, Honorable Schlunger, from your side, perhaps a parting word for the audience here? The parting words would be, Namibia is ready for business. We have all the ingredients that it takes to, for good investment. Our country is stable. We are peaceful. We have sound financial systems. We have all the infrastructure. We are rated the, 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 the best infrastructure when it comes to Africa. And uh, we are welcoming all the investors that are interested in this uh, green hydrogen. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that intervention. I just want to, as my parting shot, just remind us, of course, that Namibia is a country of rule of law. Uh, and in terms of our foreign policy, we are a friend to all. We are non-aligned. And Germany, of course, has been that friend through uh, thick and thin. And hopefully going forward, we are going to improve on that relationship. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for making time. Thank you very much, Honorable Cornelia. Round of applause for them, please. I now hand back over to the capable hands of Mr. Denver Kisting. Thank you. Another round of applause for the capable Mr. Ricardo Nkwagasep, Honorable Cornelia Shilunga as well as His Excellency, Mr. Herbert Beck. A powerful conversation starter. We have to bear in mind that this platform is rich with material, rich with information, of course, rich with discourse. But in the end, it will serve as a conversation starter, hopefully in people's homes, in their living rooms, in their kitchens, on the commute to work. And that is how we will see to it that the average Namibian takes ownership of the conversation, channels their questions, their concerns in a constructive way to the avenues that exist to make sure that the fears are allayed, that whatever concerns there are are dealt with also in a constructive manner, and that we all pull in the same direction, namely forward. As a practical demonstration of the thick element, specifically of the thick and through thick and thin element of the relationship between the Federal Republic of Namibia and Germany. There seemed to have been a bit of surprise about my entry-level German proficiency, which I demonstrated yesterday. Well, there you have it. That was the practical, practical manifestation of that tiny bit of that relationship. Herr uh, Beck, danke schön. For those just joining us virtually, this is day two of the Namibia National Green Hydrogen Conference 2022. We are moving, the time is now, we are ready. And as we established yesterday, as the land of the brave, right honorable prime minister, we were in fact born ready. That is our reality. We're getting to a very important part of the program. I'd like to call on Mr. Jason Kasutu, the chairperson of the Economic Association of Namibia, to introduce to us our keynote speaker for today, Mr. Kasuto. Good morning. I will stand by the protocol already established. Um, it makes us extremely happy as a, and excited as an economic association of Namibia to actually be standing by our mandate. And our mandate is really, as we said yesterday, and we were asked, how do you do it? Is really to be able to bring together the private sector, public sector, 
and create avenues such as these that would positively influence policy and the economic development of our country. So that demonstration is clear with the level of policymakers that we've got in this room today from a ministerial level um, covering the ministries of mines, uh, covering the, the blue economy also, covering the environment as well. And of course, the head of government business in parliament, the right honorable prime minister, who I have a distinguished pleasure of introducing. Uh, right honorable prime minister, Sara Kugongerwa, became a member of the National Assembly in 1995 as a Director General of the National Planning Commission at the age of 27, a position which she held up until 2003, where she became the Minister of Finance, a position she held from 2003 to 2015, and then appointed by His Excellency Dr. Hage Genkop as the fourth Prime Minister of the Republic of Namibia in 2015, and the first female Prime Minister of the Republic of Namibia. It gives us great pleasure to welcome you to the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kasuto. You may please take your seat. Director of Ceremonies. Honorable Minister of Mines and Energy and other ministers present here, Honorable Deputy Minister of Mines and Energy and other deputy ministers present here, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Your Worship the Mayor of Winduk and other mayors present here, the Chief Executive Officer of the Investment Protection and Development Board, Ms. Nangula Wanja, Mr. Jason Kasuto, Chairperson of the Economic Association of Namibia, Distinguished invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. I am delighted to address this conference this morning, which brings together stakeholders from public and private sectors to share experiences and learn best practices on green hydrogen under the theme Namibia Towards a Green Hydrogen Hub in Africa. I was unfortunately unable to be with you yesterday due to cabinet duties. This conference comes at a most opportune time for Namibia as it seeks to establish itself as a major player in global green hydrogen markets. According to the Global Opportunity Analysis and Industry Forecast for 2021 to 2028, the global green hydrogen market size was valued at only 300 million in 2020, but is projected to reach 9.8 billion US dollars by 2028. In terms of the Harambe Prosperity Plan II, green hydrogen is said to be a core pillar in Namibia's economic and developmental agenda, offering potential for the country to develop a sustainable green hydrogen industrial base that will drive socioeconomic growth, create employment, and emerge as a sustainable energy supply for Namibia, Southern Africa, and beyond. Our government thus committed itself to put in place a competitive and transparent process for the development of the Green Hydrogen Project, which is designed to maximize the national benefits and lay the foundation for long-term participation in a growing green hydrogen and ammonia market. Namibia took the first step to position itself at the forefront of the global aspirations for green hydrogen production in 2021 by setting in motion plans to develop the country's first vertically integrated green hydrogen project in the Southern Corridor Development Initiative. The aim is to develop a major integrated high-capacity hydrogen project valued at 9.4 billion US dollars. The project is expected to eventually produce 300,000 tons of raw hydrogen annually 
for the domestic, regional, and international markets. It is estimated that this landmark project will create 15,000 direct jobs in the four years of integrated construction and 3,000 direct jobs during the first two phases while contributing to other efforts to promote economic stability. Namibia is looking at developing a full-scale green hydrogen industry with upstream and downstream opportunities for Namibia's private sector along the value chain. Upstream opportunities exist in areas such as wind turbines and solar panels assembly, IT services, consulting and water provision, while downstream prospects range from the production of fertilizers, green ammonia, green zinc, aviation and diamonds, as well as the construction of port and rail networks. This conference is therefore of vital importance as Namibia seeks to realize the full potential of the sector and identify areas for local participation and value addition in order for the country to take full advantage of such opportunities, create jobs, and improve the socioeconomic welfare of Namibia's people. In ensuring that Namibia is ready to develop its green hydrogen industry and its human resources capabilities, the government has signed an agreement with the German government to provide support in this endeavor, as we have heard. The German government availed 40 million euro that would be used to develop the Namibia Green Hydrogen Strategy and to fund scholarship programs that is, that is besides the cooperation that we are pursuing with other development partners, as we have heard. The 30 million euro uh, of the 30 million euro, which uh, is equivalent to about uh, 500 million Namibian dollars, uh, which is made available by German government, is being utilized to fund pilot projects in the country. And the recipients of this funding were announced yesterday morning at this conference. I understand. I was unable to follow because I was at cabinet. I want to congratulate all the recipients of this grant as they have now become part of the journey to building the hydrogen industry in Namibia. I hope that some of them are still here today. Namibia will require both professional skills and vocational skills. It is thus vital that the higher education, academic and vocational training institutions understand the industry value chain. This understanding will ensure that Namibia is prepared for the development and success of this industry. Further to this, the Namibian Ports Authority has signed a memorandum of understanding with the Port of Rotterdam. The agreement enables collaboration in various areas of mutual interest with a targeted emphasis on facilitating trade in the flow of green hydrogen supply chains from Namibia to Rotterdam to build capacity to transport the clean ammonia once the hydrogen production is underway. With regard to the regulatory framework, Namibia is currently in the process of developing its national green hydrogen strategy. Given the complexities of developing a synthetic fuel industry, the national hydrogen strategy will ensure overall policy direction and cohesion between new policy needed for this industry as well as existing legislative frameworks. Director of Ceremonies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to briefly highlight the socioeconomic impact this new green hydrogen sector will bring to Namibia. It will bring thousands of people into the formal economy by providing them and their families with a steady income. As I stated earlier, and as I'm sure you have heard already, about 18,000 direct and indirect jobs are expected to be provided by this industry in the first four years of the project. Thousands of micro and small and medium enterprises and bigger businesses upstream and downstream of this new sector will benefit from new income and business opportunities. Further, Namibia has a chance to move away from being a net electricity importer 
where, where we import about 70% of our energy to produce an energy surplus. Through this, it will also be possible to bring electricity to all corners of the country, enabling local communities to become part of this targeting development. Looking at the economy at large, the new green hydrogen sector will enable us to attain our ambitious goals to move from an emerging and developing country to an economy which is recognized globally. We will be able to provide the new energy the world needs, especially that there is a move from fossil fuels towards a decarbonized future. I therefore want to conclude by thanking the organizers of this conference for bringing together key role players in the energy and development spaces to discuss issues around investment opportunities, financing, markets, infrastructures, and identify the required skills, employment creation, as well as socioeconomic participation and development of local communities in the green hydrogen industry. I also want to thank the sponsors for their co-sponsorship of this conference and the speakers for agreeing to share their expertise and experiences with us. This is a landmark event on Namibia's roadmap towards becoming a green hydrogen champion. I urge all participants to make use of this opportunity to tap from local and international experience. And I trust that the deliberations at this event will help Namibia to position herself to benefit from the large investments expected to flow into this sector. I wish you fruitful deliberations. Since it's day two, I can no longer officially open the conference. Thank you very much. I don't know whether you're happy with yourselves, but I'm certainly not happy with you. The Prime Minister of the Republic of Namibia, Right Honorable Sarah Kongawa Amadila, certainly deserves a bigger and a warmer round of applause. <laughs> right Honorable Prime Minister Tapandula Unene. I know Dr. Van Dodere called me out yesterday afternoon and then I didn't get the floor again afterwards because I actually was ready for a rebuttal and quite a comprehensive rebuttal. In fact, now I have the opportunity, but I'm also going to hold myself accountable and not be too elaborate. The goal certainly for this conference is not consensus. The goal I want to concur with them is constructive conversation. But what there is consensus about, as far as I'm concerned, is the support and the high level support, the executive level support on the part of the Namibian government. With that, we have to agree. I'm also very happy to have heard the formal undertaking on the part of the Prime Minister that Namibia currently is in the process of developing its green hydrogen strategy. That, she says, will culminate in policy direction and cohesion, which is also important but also provide for the very important legislative framework so that our conduct is regulated, that we know that we are operating within the confines of the law, that we strike the balance between preserving our pristine, beautiful Namibia, but also see to it that we deal with the pollution, Mr. Kasutu, of inequality, unemployment, and poverty. Honorable Shilunga, I was I'm happy I didn't forget it because I wanted to mention it earlier. You said something so beautiful, and I don't know whether you coined it today, that it's not only about the gross domestic product in terms of which we measure our economic growth. It's in fact, she told us, very importantly also about the gross domestic happiness. In other words, the GDH. So we should always have regard to that. And it brings us to session five. If we allege that we are serious about the well-being of our people, but we do not care to adopt a people-centered approach, we can stop right away. 
we must never forget that we, it's about human beings. It's about the well-being of those human beings. It's about the happiness of those human beings. Those human beings are you and I. Those human beings are our fellow Namibians. The next session will have particular regard to the human resources element. For the role, I know exactly what you want to say. Can I take a chance? Very well, very well. Thank you so much, sir. I was wrong. I didn't know what you were going to say. <laughs> uh, right, Honorable Prime Minister, you made specific mention of the sponsors and the important role that they serve, because without them, this would not have been possible. So I was being presumptuous that the announcement would have been about recognizing the sponsors again. So before I deal with the formal request in your presence to demonstrate to them how we care about them and their contribution, I would just like to mention the sponsors once again. They are Saskal, Bank Vintuk, Fortescue Future Industries, Namdia, Deloitte, Clean Energy Solutions Namibia, ENS Africa, Standard Bank, First National Bank, and our central bank, the Bank of Namibia, who will be making an important monetary policy committee announcement in about 38 minutes. But I have not been informed that, unfortunately, the Prime Minister will not be able to be in our company for the day. She has very important matters to deal with, so we're very grateful for her and indebted to her for having made the time to be with us and for having demonstrated and cemented the support on, on the part of government. So I would like us to stand as we are able, as we say goodbye to Right Honourable Prime Minister Sara Kohengawa Amadila, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Namibia. You may take your seats. I do want to say that you are amazing. Um, and we've certainly upped our game um, as far as today is concerned, juxtaposed against yesterday. So thank you very much for it. You all deserve another round of applause. So as I was saying earlier, we're moving into session five of the conference. And we should never forget that it's about people, it's about human beings, it's about their well-being, it's about their happiness. Specifically for the role of research and human capital development in green hydrogen development in the land of the brave, I'd like to call upon Dr. Jane Olboch, the executive director of SASCO, for Doc, according to the program, as it stands in my hand, you had the grand total of 15 minutes. May I subtract five of those 15 minutes, or will it be a problem? You'll use 10. Yes. Um, she, she agreed in your presence. Let's please give her a huge round of applause. Program Director, distinguished guests, good morning. Um, my name is Jane Oldwatch, and I wanted to say something very quickly when the Prime Minister and the rest of the ministers are here, but I'll still say it. To even strengthen the cooperation between Germany and Namibia, I wanted to say that SASCO is a brainchild of Germany and Namibia and other Sada countries. So that's why we are here. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here this morning and on behalf of SASCO, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving us this chance not only to speak about capacity building, but also to show what else that we do as an institution that was born out of the collaboration between the German government and the countries in Sada.
All right, so my presentation will follow, the, will follow the, this, these points. First of all, of course, I know even from yesterday, people were asking, who is SASCO? Is SASCO a person? Is SASCO an organization? So I just have one slide that I want to talk about SASCO. Then from there, I'll just share with you the important skills in the 21st century. And this is because I feel that we need to question our education system as we prepare ourselves to take part in the 21st century. Then I also show you one slide of the research investments in Africa and in comparison with the other countries. And then trends in researchers in Southern Africa. Then I will have more words to say on SASCO's contribution to the research landscape and capacity development. And I will conclude. So who is SASCO? SASCO was formed in 2012, and this was a result of the COP13 that highlighted the importance of regional centers in addressing climate change. And in that 2012, five countries in SADC, Angola, Botswana, South Africa, Namibia, and Zambia, with funding from the German government, agreed to form SASCO. And of course, SASCO was formed as a response of the global change challenges. In West Africa, you have another organization, it's called WASCO, which is also funded by the BMBF and also incorporates the ECOWAS countries and all the other aligned countries that are necessary. So BMBF is a main, a main fund of SASCO, core research program um, in climate, of course, green hydrogen, human capital development and research infrastructure, and member countries contribute to the operation of the organization. And I'm very happy to thank the government of Namibia through the Ministry of Water, Agriculture, and Land Reform to have been the first country to ratify the SASCO Treaty. We thank them for that because that put us to an international organization. So international partnership, like everyone has said, like the one we have between BMB and SASCO member states, increases our ability and capacity to tackle complex challenges such as climate change that no one country can be able to solve. So what are those skills that the 21st century young scientist or engineer want? We all already know what we do, but these have been highlighted in a paper that I read last night and looks at basic integrated science process skills. How do you process science? How do you understand science? Digital age literacy is extremely important. Scientific literacy, technology literacy, which talks about how does technology work? And of course, information, media, and social skills. Examples of that could be data science and analytics, remote sensing and GIS programming, mathematical modeling, and engineering. Content is no longer the issue because content exists everywhere. You can Google all the lectures that they give you, but you need to know how do you process this data? How do you transfer the data into images that government departments can look and see the trend in change on climate and water resources? The lecturer also is no longer the content owner but an instructor. In our age, the lecturer had a book, and that was the only book. I share with you a story. One time, I, I was uh, a, a professor lent me a book over the weekend because I saw so much interest in, especially the origin of HIV. But during that weekend, I also had a fashion show. I was raising money for our, our hall. Unfortunately, the professor was also in the room. On Monday morning, when we went to class, he called me up. I thought he was going to thank me, but he said, give me my book. I did not give you the book to go for a fashion show. So those days, the book was owned by the lecturer, but not anymore. We can Google everything. So we have to teach our young people skills. They can map water and environment and put them into special analytics and really be able to help our government. So investment in research in Africa. Africa is a rich continent. I say it all the time. We have so much resources. We are home of 1.3 million people, likely reaching this 
March 2.5 by 2050, we are the youngest continent. We boast 60% of the Arab lands and large trees of water, including minerals and everything else. But we account for only 1% of research spending and therefore producing 0.1% of all patents. That cannot take us to innovation. We are lagging behind and funding research is extremely important, is urgent if we want to be, take active law in the 21st century. I don't know whether you'll be able to see this map, but it looks at the number of researchers per region and per selected countries. It's very clear that even Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africa alone is not comparable to single countries in Europe, in Japan. So we must, if we want to take part, really fund research, um, think about new skills, think about networking and collaboration with other, other researchers so that we can really partake in what this world gives us. Uh, here we look at trends in researchers in Southern Africa. For here, I wanted to highlight more the engineering field and of course, Namibia, because we are in Namibia and the topic was about Namibia, you can see if you compare the different um, themes, natural science still takes the biggest, but engineering on the other hand is still dwindling behind. So for green hydrogen, where are the skills? Where are the people that are going to manage this massive project that we are busy talking about? Then of course I mentioned engineering is an area that we need to really focus on and make sure that we prepare our countries to be able to take part and look after these projects and make sure that we even develop more, more and more. So what is SASCO doing? SASCO is contributing a lot on the research landscape in, in the region. In the past we have funded over 88 research projects in different countries in SADC and our scientists have contributed to over 200 papers in international review articles and, and other things. And of course, we are now going into SASCO 2, which is other 13 projects that we are going to start. And of course, Namibia is also benefiting from this for over 2 million euros. Very interesting project, again, that are going to last uh, from 2022 to 2025. And of course, we're also contributing to data. One of the most important things about research is data and information. And our government departments want data, not tomorrow, right now. And they do not only want data, but information that they can be able to use and say, I, I can do this because of, of the data from, from SASCOM. And with that, again, from funding from BMB, if we have over 164 automatic weather stations in the different countries. And this deliver data near real time and is housed in our weather net, an automatic and an online system, and everybody who wants can ask for data and we can deliver it. What else have we done? You cannot do research without infrastructure. We have also spent a lot of money on research infrastructure, including observatories, laboratories, soil quality analysis, herbarium, again, and all this to strengthen the research landscape to be able to partake in what the 20th um, agenda provides for us. Human capital development is extremely important to the organization. Over the past, we have funded over 300 masters and PhD students because we believe that research and human capital development creates knowledge economy and of course, knowledge economy underpins social and economic development. Currently, we also have um, what we call the SASCO Graduate Studies Program Integrated Water Resources Management, hosted by NAS. And 12 PhD students have already started. We call this a center of excellence. We aim to produce students that can create jobs, that can be able to be job uh, providers themselves. And that's not all, of course, I'm very happy and really proud to be part of this journey between German and, and Namibia. And of course, we'll, we launched the three programs that were spoken about highly, the um, scholarship, the pilots, and also the strategy. And with the scholarship, we sent in an application some time back, and we have received so much interest, 1,154 applicants from Namibia. We are busy processing the application to go together with our colleagues that we work with, some of them are here, and we hope 
that this will be announced uh, through the government, of course, before the year ends. SASCO, of course, is the implementer of the joint communique of intent signed between Namibia and the German government. We, the H2 Atlas, this was the first project of green hydrogen in the African continent. And this project is almost over. We have been looking at the potential of African countries to produce green hydrogen. We started in 2020 during COVID, and we were working to our countries, 16 experts in the region, 16 experts from German, and 60 member states are all working on this project. What this will do will be an atlas that will show hotspots of green hydrogen production in the whole of SADC. Even before the results are out, which will be out before the end of the year, Namibia already has a lot of potential, and therefore that's why they have to continue with the journey to, to the project. We really hope this will be one of those contributions that has never existed before. It is a reference data set for green hydrogen production in our 12 African countries. So, in conclusion, distinguished guests, honorable ministers, colleagues, let us not forget why we are here. It's climate change. Every year, greenhouse gas increase is clear. We see it every day in SADAC. These are some of the pictures I was using to show SADAC, the droughts of 1990, um, 2019. We got rain last year, and now, but this is not going to be permanent. But what is frightening now is that the droughts that are happening in Europe at the moment. Rivers have dried, crops are failing, and this is something that will really keep us on our toes. And even when we stand, start green hydrogen, we must not forget. It's climate change, because when we forget and we make it just a business as any other business, we might make mistakes like we made with coal and oil again, polluting the environment and creating new issues. So let's not forget climate change is here, we are living it and it's already weakening our, our countries and governments to move towards better economy. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Doc. She deserves another round of applause. <laughs> Honorable Minister Shifeta, I have not come across anyone else in Namibia, perhaps you, but who's as passionate about climate change in this country, but the impact on the globe as Dr. Jane Olbert. Would you agree with me? So she says, that is what it is ultimately about. Let's not lose focus. Let us always remember why exactly it is that we are here. And yes, Namibia's carbon footprint may not be extensive, but the unfortunate reality is we also bear the brunt, and we bear the brunt quite seriously. So that needs to be the primary point of departure, and it will help us understand the context, the importance, the urgency of everything else. But she also very eloquently reminded us about capacity building in terms of skills, in terms of research, and I suppose development, Professor Peters would always add, it's R&D, right, Prof? but also infrastructure, um, and human capital development also relies very heavily on collaboration, and that's exactly what's happening in this space, in this room. I've been informed that the next speaker, unfortunately, will not join us. So, Prof. Anisha Peters, for those of you who didn't tune in yesterday, for those of you who may not have been in the room yesterday, Professor Peters is one of the truest troopers in the land of the brave, committed not only to research and development and excellence, but you know, known by her team members and even those who've never worked alongside her about how she rolls up her sleeves and she gets her own hands dirty and does what needs to be done. She will talk to us about the Green Hydrogen Research Institute a look at the successful pilot projects at the University of Namibia's desalination plant and solar projects in Hentis Bay and Luderitz, respectively. 
Prof, notwithstanding that generous introduction, you also only have 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Let's give her a round of applause. Wow, Denver, I thought I was gaining because there's somebody absent. Nonetheless, honorable ministers and all of the esteemed delegates present, um, thank you so much for this opportunity to stand here. I will just say this is the water from UNAM's desalinated plant. We actually bottle it in Henty's Bay at our campus. So if you need some, you know where to find us. I have some more over there if you want to take it for a taste test, but taste testing revealed that it is the best product on the market. So, let's see, what was green was forward and red was back, right? Okay, now the prof, okay. So, I was asked to speak about the Namibia Green Hydrogen Research Institute. Um, we're hosting it at UNAM, but it is, it is in its structure supposed to be, and function supposed to be, a national institute. So, what it is, the goal of it is essentially to provide research for the green hydrogen market for Namibia in particular. So we want a research and development hub. We want to provide for exchange of expertise. And I want to tell you that we've already done that. So it's not only you know, what it is supposed to provide, but what it is already providing. We have already been hosting visiting researchers, and we've already been hosting also master's students. We want to upskill and reskill mid-level to uh, professional levels. And in this regard, it is also happening. With, for instance, the BUM Institute in uh, Germany, that is the Federal Institute for Material um, Science, Bundesanstalt für Materialforschung um, und Prüfung. Um, we've already started to revise and add components into our masters in renewable energy, and that is a stream in hydrogen and synthetic fuels. What we've also done is under that for, what is it, reskilling, we've also added a, a curriculum is under development for blockchain uh, technologies. Um, we're working with a partner in Rwanda on that, with the Africa, what is it, Blockchain Institute. And then we are also developing short courses, again, together with various partners, such as hydrogen safety and handling. We spoke about it yesterday, the need for that. We are looking at materials compatibility for hydrogen, etc. So with that, it is already happening. So that's why I'm saying, even though we're looking at the goals, we're already fulfilling some of those goals. And then collaborate with organizations who develop local businesses. Now, this institute was established in October 2021. And yesterday, we witnessed how we were all very excited to see the announcements of the pilot projects. There were how many pilot projects selected? Four. Cheryl, of course, you would know that. And out of those four, the Research Institute and UNAM were partnered to three. Three out of four. Guys, we deserve a round of applause. I don't know. I, I was trying to contain my excitement, but I'm really, truly excited. Um, and then in addition to this collaboration and skilling and research, we're also providing um, weekly seminars since last year already um, on Wednesdays at lunchtimes, that's for the public, um, on green hydrogen. 
So there's a number of things that are going on. And in addition to that, we um, are also deepening our research topics um, and areas for green hydrogen and recruiting more masters and PhD students. Uh, me, um, I also got roped into sort of supervising some of those students. So let's just say it is happening. And then another thing that we are doing, which is loading currently, is that we are going to host a joint research conference together with NAST in the coming month. Round of applause for that, please. I think that that's an exciting, um, an exciting endeavor because we have this conference here, but we also want to hear from the researchers, not only from academia, but also in industry, there's oftentimes research. So we're pretty excited about that. And then, of course, we will be working on all of the cool um, pilot projects. Okay, so that's a little bit about the introduction of what it was intended to do and what it's doing already. But what does it look like? And this is what it looks like. We have under the Research Institute, which is virtually distributed at the moment, we have labs all over um, different campuses and researchers who are not yet dedicated in one center, but actually working within their labs with their own students. So we have a center for um, hydrogen production. This talks to desalination, um, wind, solar, um, electroly uh, electrolysis, etc. cetera. So, um, so that's what we're doing in there. Then we have a center for hydrogen storage, uh, new materials and delivery. We, for instance, have a new materials lab that we have um, inaugurated in March this year at our southern campus where the geosciences um, is, um, is located. Another one that we have is we have a center for hydrogen fuel cell technology and mobility applications. The very energetic uh, Dr. Shafuda, whom I'm not seeing now, um, is one of the researchers actually in fuel cell technologies. And in fact, they have a lab that specializes in thin films. Um, and so they're also looking on how to, to sort of develop and innovate, I guess, new materials for that. Um, then we have a center for hydrogen energy use, economics, law, environment, and society. Because hydrogen is not only about the technical stuff, but it's also about all of the things that surrounding us. How does it impact communities? You know, what's going to happen? Um, yesterday we spoke a lot about environmental law. Um, and then of course tomorrow we'll speak about the economics. We're looking at use within Namibia as well. You know, use as fertilizer, use possibly, you know, um, as fueling the trucks. Um, we're looking at, for instance, at um, one of the engineering campuses to convert the engines right here in Namibia to, to use green hydrogen, right? So engine conversions is all part of this. Then we have a center for hydrogen capacity building competence and standards, and this is where we're talking about um, capacity development, human resource development. This is the, the sort of almost like a progress report that I'm giving where we're looking at which curricula is not conforming, which curricula needs to be updated, which new ones need to come in. Because we, for instance, have a lot of engineering degree offerings in Namibia, but we don't have chemical engineering as a degree offering, for instance. So those are some of the gaps that we're looking at and how to address it. And I don't want to go into the how, because we do not always have all of the skills and expertise right here in Namibia which means that we have to partner, and as academia, it's natural for us to partner with professors from a different university, and then in so doing, bring in the expertise or do the capacity building. Um, of course, there's a whole section on upskilling and reskilling. Um, for not only your formal courses, 
but as we see, we're developing short courses as well, but the TVETs have a big role to play, and the institute will not replace sort of, you know, what the TVET sector has to do, but rather collaborate, right? So that we strengthen each other, because institutional strengthening, especially amongst the educational institutions, is one of the core goals um, of what we're striving for. Then we have a center for hydrogen digital and emerging technologies. There's quite a lot of technologies within um, green hydrogen that is still, um, you know, in its infancy or immature, um, and they're very expensive because of that. So we are working, we're collaborating with different research institutes in different parts of the world to see how best, you know, or, or what is being done with that. We, for instance, have projects with KU Leuven in Belgium where we're looking at um, hydrogen um, production actually just from, you know, capturing it from the humidity in the air, as an example. So we're constantly looking at new ways. One of the things that we're doing as well is we're working on recruiting a Fulbrighter um, currently from the US. We're working with the US Embassy on that in green hydrogen who will be within our institute. So those are numerous examples of that. Of course, I am, as everybody knows, I am passionate about digital technologies. And within this entire production, right, um, where we are striving to go. There's a lot of digital technologies that come in. There's a lot of AI, there's a lot of IoT, there's a lot in the manufacturing, and one of the things we are striving to do is to look at how can we also set up sort of learning factories where you simulate the environment within factories, simulate the technologies to be used. Um, we have, for instance, the blockchain technologies for creating a verifiable record for tracking, you know, whether all of your sources were green throughout your supply chain. So those are, and, and that will answer the question because people always ask, what does blockchain have to do with green hydrogen? And that's essentially it. There are, in fact, entire centers in the world built around just blockchain technologies for, for energy, not only green hydrogen, but for energy. Okay, so, one of the things that I want to um, touch on, I can't see Denver, so I guess I'm still good. <laughs> Didn't check my time. Um, one of the things is that we have to look at the enabling environment, the enabling legislation, the, env in the sustainability options for the research institute, um, for us, as well as the environmental sustainability. So all of it, I think, is, is a chain that is interconnected. Now, I was asked to speak about the successful pilot projects that UNAM had, but instead, I thought, let me focus a little bit on, you know, why um, UNAM was sort of so excited to jump on board with this um, Green Hydrogen Research Institute. First of all, we have in our strategic plan explicitly um, put as a strategic goal climate change mitigation and adaptation, which means that whatever we're doing at the university, we are actually trying to see whether, how do we meet this goal and how do we go about you know, meeting that goal. So whether we have the seeds project that we have that's looking at drought resistant seed varieties in a variety of seeds and in the, um, the, the potatoes project and where we are busy with replication multiplication, you can see that speaks to climate change. So the pilots in desalination we have at our, at our Hentis Bay campus, the Sam Neoma campus, um, and from that water that we ha that's powered by solar, and from that water that we have, we are bottling some of the water, and that is because of regulatory um, hindrances that we had before. Um, that um, NAM water, for instance, is the only bulk water supplier. Um, 
so you have restrictions on that. Then we are also sort of doing uh, uh, desert agriculture. Um, so we have, for instance, different um, types of um, vegetables, etc., in our greenhouses that we're experimenting with. In a desert environment, we have 800 olive trees that we've planted, and so on and so on. The list goes on with what we're doing with it. Then we also have, of course, the wind um, project in um, Ludritz, which was a community project that was requested by the community. It was powering their uh, charity project. For UNAM, it was a demonstration project to show that this can work. We handed over the project to the community, but when we handed it over, we made sure that five of the community members were actually trained as technicians. The sad story about that project is actually that all of the sewing machines got stolen, the transformers got stolen, and everything got stolen. So we're trying to see with the town council and the community how to sort of revive it. Um, yes. So now it's saying I should make a move on. Okay. So at UNAM, we have over 70 researchers who's actually working you know, with areas or topics related to green hydrogen. And this is why it was such a natural fit. However, we also have five researchers from NAST working um, with the institute. And then, as you could see yesterday with the pilot projects, we have a host of other local and international partners working with us. I think one of our strengths, especially looking at green hydrogen, was the first thing we started doing when we engaged with partners to look at where are we setting up pilot plants. Um, because I do believe that pilot plants are the way to go, sort of to test our technologies, to test you know, how does it interact et cetera, with the environment, etc. And this is what we have. We have a lot of land available. Some of them are farms, that's where we have our crop production, um, et cetera. Um, and some of it is, um, of course, we have 12 campuses spread across the country. But this is what we had availed and we said, okay, to partners, okay, where do you need to set up a pilot plan? Let's see what we can do as, as UNAM. Okay, this is just the um, desalination plant. Uh, this is the water that we're producing. This is some of the um, uh, hydroponics projects uh, and, the, as I said, desert agriculture that we're doing. Um, this is, of course, the wind um, project. So, Denver, in a minute. Oh, my goodness, I'm pushing for a minute again. Anyways, so for us, when we set up, like, pilot plants, we have to show impact. And pilot plants should also serve to upskill, reskill, and capacitate. Whether it is your researchers, whether it is the, the people, like students from TVETS, for instance, can come into your pilot plants, help with construction on some things, etc. So it, it, it should be a capacitating endeavor as well. But we need regulatory sandboxes. Um, I, for one, am not going again through some pilot projects where we, where we cannot move on, we cannot upscale, we cannot provide free water to a section of the community, to a hospital, to a school, we can't provide free electricity to that. It doesn't serve, you know, if, if, if we are so hindered that we can't show that impact, what does it mean for communities? Why are you setting up this pilot plant and testing it? And then, of course, um, I think we're looking at research chairships and scholarships in the future, much more of that. But we need specialist training for our training of trainers, uh, for our trainers. And that be it TVETs, be it in the university, we can quickly upskill people. They don't need to go and, you know, redo everything. Um, and then we will be doing a replication model where we will have a critical mass of trainers who can train quickly others. And then green hydrogen, of course, needs different layers of skilled personnel. So it's not only specialist, but it's also, let's say, for instance, um, you know, um, in the, um, what is it, entrepreneurs, could be caterers, could be cleaners. All of them form part of our green hydrogen 
um, sort of value chain. And then one thing that's important for me, and that's my final point, Denver, coordination and collaboration for skills development in this country is a prerequisite. We cannot be pulling in different directions. We have to, all of us, just like the Green Hydrogen Council, I think it's one of the best success stories, have these ministers sitting you know, and meeting, whether they meet every two weeks or so, but they sit together and they sort of say, how do we solve this, this, this? So for us, on skills development and capacity building, all actors need to come together and play a role. With that, I thank you. It's difficult to be strict with her because she's such an expert and she speaks with authority and conviction. Is that also your sense? Ladies and gentlemen, fellow excellence practitioners, fellow critical thinkers, is that also your sense? I can imagine, and it, thank you very much. I can imagine, and it would make absolute sense, that we are in dire need of a bit of tea and stretching our legs. That break is imminent, provided you help me hold the speakers accountable in terms of honoring the very precious resource of time. I know that is a deal. Namibia belongs to all of us. Namibia's green hydrogen will belong to all of us, irrespective of, amongst others, political affiliation. However, we do know how important party politics especially is, what role it plays in terms of mobilizing resources, maintaining the constructive dialogue and discourse, particularly in a constitutional democracy such as ours. Why am I saying all of this? I would like to acknowledge the presence of the Independent Patriot for Changes President, Dr. Panduleni Filimon Banda Itula. Doc, we're very happy to have you and welcome. Let's please give him a round of applause. And contrary to popular belief, um, Dr. Itula and I actually get along very well. Right, Doc? <laughs> In any case, the shoe, shoe fits, and therefore the show needs to move forward. Talent development, talent attraction, but also talent retention. It doesn't help that you get the right people. It doesn't help that you, in fact, invest in training the right people, but you don't know how to keep them. You don't know how to develop them further. You don't know how to turn them into developers of other people and other leaders. The, sec the next session, therefore, gives me great delight because we were talking about attracting talent and knowledge to the green hydrogen industry. We know what skills we will need now already, so how are we going to start attracting those skills for the imminent future to ultimately strengthen our career trajectories. For that, we're joined by Mr. Mvatera Njode Sirika, the Acting Chief Executive Officer at the Namibia Training Authority. Let's put our hands together for him. <laughs> Sir, you have a total of five minutes. Is that fair or reasonable or just? Yeah, more than enough. More than enough. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Director of Ceremonies, the Honorable Ministers that are present here. I'm terribly sorry, sir. Um, there's a big, big oversight that I need to deal with. So some of you had the misfortune to have some of your earthly belongings confiscated this morning. Is that correct? We won't hold it against you, but we know you exist. So your early belongings that were confiscated earlier this morning are available right now at the VIPP police. Are you able to make your way there quickly to go fetch those? Or otherwise, you'll have to say goodbye to them forever. We also won't look um, who is going to leave the room, but please leave the room right away. Sorry, sir. 
Yes, uh, good morning, colleagues. Um, Director of Ceremonies, ministers present here, the Your Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and friends. Of course, I cannot take anything away from what Professor just presented. Um, what one can only do is actually build on what she just presented. Also, in the previous uh, presenter also, I could see what is actually coming forth. Now, in, in preparing our position, of course, as NTA, what was exciting to me was that the, it was so interesting that Namibia is a small country and has a small economy. We actually came through this, the, the, the breakthrough agenda on the hydrogen it's just of recent, it's only of 2021, if I'm not mistaken. That was a meeting that took place in Scotland. And 2021, you are talking of 2022, Namibia is there and is actually saying, yes, we are ready to play the game. We know it's a big, big boys or big girls game, but here we are. And of course, with that, we are saying, um, we have what it takes. Of course, we had it from our, our minister, and I think, yes, as NTA, we are saying we are also ready to take the bull by its own and see how we can uh, manage the situation, taking into account what is available as a smaller economy. In as much as we also want to benefit from green hydrogen in terms of the electricity that comes through from it the, 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 and all the other benefits from the uh, uh, the, the benefits that come with it. We also want to say that, yes, we know the big, the big boys and big economies are out there. They are doing whatever they are doing for themselves. But we are saying we want to export whatever we can. In as much as we use it for our local economy, we also want to export it to you. But to do that, we need the necessary skills. That being the case, I will try and check with... Um, okay. Good. Of course, uh, the Namibia Training Authority is an agency of state. Um, it's an agency of state. Of course, we have. Uh, let me. Sorry. What? If I go back. Red button. Okay. And then. The, of course, I want to look at the whole issue of uh, the, the green hydrogen, the various phases. That's the content that we're going to have, the phases that we're going to go through, the benefits that we have from green hydrogen, the possible areas of application, the renewable energy resources, the professions and vocations that are actually going to come out of that and that we need to prepare ourselves for. Now, that being the case, of course, we, um, we have a mandate through our act, that is Act 1 of 2028, uh, 2000, 2008. We are one of the, of, of the agency of state that falls under the Ministry of Higher Education. But we do, at currently, we have a lot of, um, we have a multifaceted mandate. We are a regulator, yes, in the Tibet field. We are equally a funder in the Tibet field. We also run the public institutions, uh, Tibet providers. In addition to, we've got about seven, eight, nine of them, in addition to the private sector providers. At the same time, in the Tibet area, we do develop qualifications. We do research in Tibet, but this area is very, very, very low. Very low. We need more people to come on board. And for those of you who may know our history, where we are coming from, of course, this was a preserve of some. 
It only became opened up even to the blacks by 1980. 1990, literally, is the one that opened up Tibet to black, uh, to, 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 to all, all and sundry. So that's the history and the reality where we are coming from. And therefore, of course, in the area of research, we are lacking, in, with, particularly with, when it comes to Tibet. We do provide assessment and a certification. We, do have a, we are the certification and assessment, assessment body for Tibet. But at the same time, of course, we do advocate for these areas, and that's why when I'm emphasizing this area that we, we are lagging behind, we need more of you, more of the young people to come on board, do studies in Tibet, come on board, and do your research. Now, if you look at the phase approach, we are saying, I, I think my colleague has already covered that part. She has said it all with regard to what are we supposed to be doing? With whom are we supposed to be partnering with? Because they have already done that. Um, so I can say, yes, there is the other area of research. The university is there, is ready. Various institutions are set up, and we are developing that. But we need to also, at the same time, of course, some of those issues she has touched on, we need to develop the right policies, regulations, and support, the, the support networks for the local market. We need to define the governance and institutional frameworks. We need to, of course, develop the funding model. Uh, we need also the necessary agreements. I think she has talked to most of these, these issues that I'm talking about. I, I would move on and say, what are the benefits? The benefits, of course, and that's why I said, as, as a smaller economy, somebody may even ask themselves and say, but what has Namibia got to do with green hydrogen? Small as it is, small in terms of population, small in terms of industrial development and manufacturing sector, but we are saying, yes, we want to benefit from those areas. We want to benefit from the areas of development in terms of the manufacturing sector. We want to increase our supply chain uh, capabilities as a small economy. Of course, we want to create jobs for our people. There are jobs that are going to be created. Green hydrogen use, of course, is, is growing in the world, in other parts of the world. But it also has, a, there is also a greater potential for its growth. I think we've heard from the, 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 His Excellency, the German Ambassador. Um, Germany was solely dependent on energy supply from Russia. And you have seen it, what has happened. It's a reality of the new times. But that being the case, uh, Germany, was, of course, is also involved in this industry. Um, they have been developing. But we are saying, yes, we will develop. And, um, you know, um, people always refer to the German relations between Namibia and Germany, um, historic, um, and what have you. But I also say, yes, um, they are very cultural. We share the people, be they German speakers, but we also share people that are hybrids between Namibians and and Germans. It's a reality of this country. And not only that, there's another reality that uh, German is spoken in this country. Outside Germany and outside Europe, it's actually in this country where German is spoken. That's the reality of our, our relations and our, our links. Now, of course, the possible areas of application she has touched on. The area of transportation, the chemical, industri the chemical and industrial area, uh, the power plants, uh, the stationary uh, power plants, and the integrated hybrids uh, stations. And of course, some of those, we may not be in that position ourselves as a smaller economy, but from the institutes that he has indicated earlier on, those are some of the areas that we need to look into. You have an example of South Africa, which is next door, one of the bigger economy next door to us that we are also uh, dependent on. Um, South Africa is actually looking at, they were also saying that they want to become the hub. We are saying we want to be the hub. Now, 
they have their benefit of the Sasol industry and all that. They have that benefit. But we are saying, yes, we are on board. We are ready to play the game to the, to the strictest terms that we can. But reality that we can look at is in the South African setup. I think you can see it for yourselves that we are looking at the South African economies, they are looking at having a, a 10 giga, gigawatts uh, capacity to produce electricity, uh, kilotons, uh, hydrogen. They are also looking at in creating employment and they are saying 20,000 jobs annually by 2030. And by 2040, they are talking of 30,000 jobs. Now, if our colleagues are saying that, what are we saying? But we can only do that if we follow some of those areas that she, my colleague earlier referred to, referred to, setting up those necessary institutions and infrastructure for us to develop the sales industry, uh, conversion of those vehicles. In fact, I, I, was, I had the benefit of um, when I was doing my, my research on this issue, I looked at what Tanzania did. The Dar es Salaam Institute of Technology is already converting these heavy trucks that we have here, Land Cruisers. Most of the food 2.5s have been converted into hydrogen use. Now, why not? Why can't our institutions here locally do that? These cars are full up here. They are gasless, but they also uh, destroy the, the environment. So that's another reality that we can also look at. Um, the vocations, of course, that are going to come from this area. There are many, yes. Um, they, are, they are saying renewable energy sources create more jobs than the fossil, fossil industries that we, we, we are coming from. So, and this was a statement made in 20, 2013. They are saying by 2013, 6.5 million people were work, already working in the renewable energy sector. That was the worldwide. And in, in that, they are saying technicians are the action men or women of renewable energy, uh, energy world. They work with their hands and with, with the tools and machinery, special equipment and vehicles. Now, of course, all that is dependent on your national economic level. The possible areas of renewable energy vocations, of course, can be the level of technicians, technical designers and consultants, energy advisors, business development ex executives, and, and, and the list goes on. But all that is dependent on how, where we are in, the, in our economy. I, when I was also doing my, 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 my research on this issue, I, I looked at what South Africa has to offer in terms of uh, skills persons. The reality of the situation is that there are no new skills, specifically that uh, the, the current skills that we have in, in the industry, they are not necessarily going to be displaced. We are going to upskill them, some of them. The others, depending on your economic level, you will have to introduce more and better, better skills levels. Now, that in itself, we are saying from the TVET sector, we are saying, yes, we do have the skilled persons, of course, we know we are not meeting the, the demands of the economy at the point in time, but the current people that we have in industry, we can up those skills, we can better them, and we are upping them by now, currently, working on introducing diploma courses at some of our TVET institutions. We are in discussions in, with our colleagues worldwide. Of course, specifically uh, the UK, um, we've looked at the African setup, and we are looking at how we can actually up the skills of some of our current courses and even move into the petrochemical industry that we are not already playing in and see how best we can position ourselves as an economy and as a people. So those are some of the issues that we, we, we are looking at. And I can only thank you on that note. Thank you so much. Okwepa, Mr. Njo there. Another round of applause for him, please. There cannot be an economy. There cannot be a green economy. There certainly cannot be a green hydrogen economy without technical and vocational skills. 
I had the huge honor to observe World Skills Africa Swakopmund 2022, and there it was perfectly demonstrated. So I'm very happy to hear what you're sharing with us, Mr. Njode, but you're also keeping us on our toes and pointing out the areas where there are gaps, where we're lacking, and we all need to accept collective and individual responsibility for that, of course. Namibia belongs to all of us. Green hydrogen belongs to all of us. Why am I saying that again, you may wonder. I would like to acknowledge the presence of the Landless People's Movement Member of Parliament, Madam Utara Motu. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you very much for joining us. Representation absolutely matters, and we're very happy to have you. We have about 20 minutes between where we are at right now, and we need to continue being progressive and forward-thinking before we head for a health tea, coffee, water, and brief networking break. So let's do what we need to do to mobilize those accountability resources and see to it that there is indeed compliance. I love how passionate the next moderator is about talent. I love how, amongst others, she's referred to as a talent economist. And I have great pleasure, delight, and it is my honor to share with you her bio. She is a human resources practitioner who has more than 19 years of experience across the private and the public sector whereby 10 years are at a senior as well as at an executive level in various capacities. Her work experience is mainly gained from the retail, transport, energy, education, and public sectors. She holds an MA in industrial psychology, human resource development, as well as an MBA. She's also a certified, I will have you know, talent economist. As a trained HR professional, her areas of expertise vary from strategic planning, human resource development management, as well as corporate governance. She is invested in leadership development, organizational development, and talent economics with specific interest in the energy sector. She also serves on various board. This lady goes by the name of Madam Julia Mutu Dana, and she is the GM Human Resources at the Namibia Training Authority. Let's invite her to the podium to introduce her panel. <laughs> Madam, you have the grand total of 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that was a poor round of applause for her, by the way. <laughs> Director of Proceedings, uh, Mr. Kisting, also known as Denver. Thank you, I'm flattered and I'm very humbled to be here this morning. Um, I would like to introduce my panel. I believe that uh, we've been all waiting for these human resources. And uh, my panel is uh, Prof. Peter, uh, Mr. Sererika, or Mr. Njode Sererika. I've got a disclaimer, he is my CEO. And when he said he's here, I said, it's game on. <laughs> and then we've got, um, Mr. Muya, Director of Labor Market Services. He's representing Honorable Nyoma, Minister of Labor, Industrial Relations, and Job Creation. If he can just come to the podium. He is coming. And then we've got Dr. Orvoch, Executive Director of Circle. She does not need an introduction. So my first question will go to Dr. Ovo. And um, I just wanted to ask, the bottom line is that the projected growth in the hydrogen sector will lead to vast new employment opportunities as business expand to serve markets and to meet new clean and sustainable energy requirements and mandates. Um, doctor, how do we create a balance between labor demand and supply of skills? Um, across the production, transformation, transport, and end use. Um, how do we avoid oversupply of skills at this stage, 
or under supply. Um, Namibia is, is known as having a lot of uh, graduates um, that are unemployed and we want to do it right this time. What should be our strategy be at this point of time? Yeah, okay, so, doctor. Um, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I think what we have heard from yesterday and in particular what we heard from the the Prime Minister and the Ministers this morning is that Namibia is ready. Okay. And I, I believe that when a country or a person is ready to do something, that will be the most important thing. Then secondly, Namibia has built all this partnership, not only in Germany, but also in so many other countries. Yes. Uh, then we have heard this morning about the skills that are going to be developed, and particularly the Green Hydrogen Institute and also what the Namibia uh, Qualification Authority has in mind. So they are already uh, enabling factors on the ground that can actually put their minds together and develop skills. Now what I have witnessed as uh, SASCO, especially when we advertise the scholarship, the, the Youth for Green Hydrogen mm -hmm. Scholarship, is that the, the, the interest is just amazing in such a short time, we got so many applications from young people. Others were coming to the office, others were uh, phoning all the time, and that is something that you cannot buy. The interest is there. So therefore, in my understanding also of skills and young people, is that uh, I think that Namibia has everything it takes, but we must step by step analyze now how many of those unemployed youth have certain qualifications. Are they grade 12? Yeah. Are they um, university? And therefore then we put in place courses that can actually uplift them. The good thing about the green hydrogen economy is that it needs different skills at different levels and in different subjects, including law, economics, and social science. So we need to take a very uh, organized approach and then use our partnerships and funding and really make sure that these young people are productive because they are ready, they want, and there are so many opportunities. So I think we have a lot of good factors and also the people that are willing to occupy them. Thank you. Dr. Ovo, are you saying that we need a, a skills framework in terms of hydrogen? Is it what you are driving towards? Uh, Dr. Jane? Are you saying that we need a skills framework? And yes. A skills framework? Exactly. Also, the good thing about green hydrogen now is that we also have to prepare ourselves. Yes. We need to bring in those new framework, those categorization. Yes, we, we, we need that too. Thank you very much, doctor. And now over to Prof. Peter, the guru. Namibia is in its infancy stage of the hydrogen project, and I've got such an appreciation of your presentation this morning. Are we going to experience an evolution of skills or a revolution of new skills? Um, and I know that we have exhausted this topic over these two days and even this morning. And which sectors will be early adapters in benefiting from the hydrogen as we are producing skills? And who are the late adapters? Wow, she's asking me a very difficult question. <laughs> but anyways, um, I think that, look, a revolution is when you radically and drastically change, you know, how, especially within um, industry or manufacturing sectors on how you do things. Um, I think that, and evolution is rather, you know, more gradual. Um, I do think that it is an evolution right. that we're seeing because we are seeing an evolution um, and adaptation in certain sectors. But for the whole of Namibia, we need to take an approach of a revolution because the, the, the reason for that is because of the short time spans. We simply don't have enough time, you know, to go and see, okay, how are we going to, you know, go and... Um, let's say, you know, put X amount of engineers through this program and how long is it going to take to get those skills to get to the point where we are? Yes, maybe it might be right. I think Robin Sherbourne spoke about it yesterday, maybe five years, to allow for the skills to build. But we simply don't have 
that um, the, the time is not on our side. Mm -hmm. So we need to go for revolution. And this is why I said earlier, it needs all of the players. And one thing that I want to say, you asked uh, Dr. Olvoch and she was looking at me <laughs> as if you were asking me. But one of the things that we need is um, we need a national skills audit. And perhaps um, Mr. Mveya will speak about, might allude to that. Yeah. But the problem is at the moment, or the challenge is that we see skills audits being done by different entities in small scale, mm -hmm. in isolation, mm -hmm. and there doesn't seem to be coordination. We also know that early on, Harvard Growth Lab has already done sort of an early analysis mm -hmm of you know, what skills would we need and where are our gaps. But the problem is, for me, is that you know, it all needs to tie together. And I think that this national skills audit, it is not only for the green hydrogen sector, but it is for, for all of the other sectors, right, um, that we need to get on board. Now, layers that might be more ready are obviously coming from the mining sector because the mining sector already are working on globally accepted practices and mm -hmm. frameworks and standards. Um, but um, let me stop there. I, I have a lot to say about that, but let me just say a national skills audit that is sort of has an apex coordinator and that might be Ministry of Labor mm -hmm. um, or NPC, but it needs to be carried out as soon as possible in the country. Thank you, Prof. Um, and you can just give her a round of applause for that. Uh, Mr. Muya, over to you. Safety standards and, and regulations and availability of training and accreditation programs are crucial to protect not only the, the public consumers, but also the independent and semi-independent workers, such as guest technicians and vehicle mechanics, who will be required to engage with hydrogen and its related technologies. Um, what actions can uh, be taken at the national level? And would you say at this point of time, do we need a regulatory framework or will the existing Labor Act of 2007 be sufficient? What is your take on this one? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Madam Moderator. I want to thank also the presenters, I missed, I was not here yesterday, but I think uh, I benefited from the, the recap. And uh, thank you very much for hosting such a, a wonderful conference. You see, I, I think they, you know the interest of the Minister of Labor. Mm -hmm. We regulate the labor sector in terms, of re, in terms of compliance with the labor laws. And also we have the interest of employment creation. Mm -hmm we have the mandate to coordinate employment creation in this country. So, but uh, I think I'll, I will just go to your question because you are referring to the regulation, although it's not really my area, but I will say that uh, our labor laws are very flexible. As we are talking now, the labor laws are under review. Even the Labor Act is mm -hmm. under review. Mm -hmm. So we feel that uh, we are ready to regulate the market uh, with the current Labor, Labor Act. Okay. So thank you, sir. If you give me time, I will talk about employment because uh, that is my interest. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we, we should give you a chance because we are speaking about 18,000 jobs, um, uh, 15,000 uh, indirect. 3,000 permanent, and uh, what is the role of the Ministry of Labor going to be? Are you going to regulate? Uh, what is your role going to be uh, when it comes to these employment opportunities? Thank you very much that you asked, you, you agreed to ask me about it. <laughs> but uh, you see, I was disappointed when I heard those figures. Disappointed because why? Uh, we have a problem with unemployment we should target more figures, high figures than that. Mm -hmm. You see, me, I look at the investment that you put in the project. Mm -hmm. I have observed in this country that we put a project of 10 billion and then you create 50 jobs. What does it mean? It means that your focus was more profit than the social part. I know that one, one moderator asked that question. Mm -hmm. 
So what we are looking at, our interest is that we have to start employing the methodology of em employment impact assessment. Just like as you do with environmental impact assessment. Mm. What is in for employment in this investment? Mm. And uh, I could question that, how did you ca arrive at 15,000 jobs with such a big uh, project? So our interest is that let's try to maximize employment in such big investment. And uh, also so that our people also should benefit from such uh, 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 investment, you see, to uplift the living standard of our people. That is our that is really our main concern and our focus. Mm -hmm. We want to see employment being maximized in this project. Mm -hmm. And also we have to conduct employment impact assessment before we invest such billions in, in any project. Uh, Thank you. Can you just give him a round of applause for that? <laughs> Employment impact assessment. So we are dropping some big words that we need to put in practice and I hope that the conference coordinators are taking notes of these concepts that are coming and they will be developed. And I believe that the Ministry of Labor is, um, is, 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 uh, is, is consulted. You are part and parcel of this project. I, I, I do hope so. Yes. Um, okay, thank you very much for that confirmation. Uh, Mr. Sererika, you have mentioned about the skills that we are going to create. Well, so internationally, countries like uh, UK, Netherlands, U USA factories owned by automotive companies, which begins to produce hydrogen f uh, vehicles, um, internal uh, retraining is simply necessary, and uh, including apprenticeship. So in your presentation, you did not touch on apprenticeship. And how is the TVET sector preparing the apprenticeship program uh, to ensure that they are adapting to potential new areas of hydrogen? And how do we get the employers on board in this case? Well, thanks. Um, our system is actually structured in such a way that um, we, we, we collaborate with the industry even when I'm saying that NTA develops curriculum, we do not actually bring a curriculum and actually impose it on, on industry. <laughs> it's a collaborative effort. Um, I deliberately not talk about uh, apprenticeship training because it's just but one of the methods of training that we employ. Mm. Uh, we have apprenticeship training, we have institutional training, but we also know that um, that institutional training is it's, it's accompanied by um, uh, job attachment, and this is condition, it's a condition precedent for certification. So, um, now, one other area that I can also mention with regard to curriculum issue is that <clears throat> in the motor industry or the automotive industry, we have already even started uh, uh, moving in that direction. We haven't moved into, of course, uh, the hydro hydrogen area but we have moved from having the traditional motor vehicle training courses to having them into what we call mechatronic. Now, of course, it's a, it's a reality of um, acknowledging the fact that most vehicles are more electronic these days, mm -hmm. more than what they have been you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, we, you, we are also mindful of the fact that m vehicles are, move, are becoming um, self-driven. Uh, self, self, self now, that's another reality that we also have to face. But we're also mindful of the fact that the, 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 the hydrocarbon industry that we've been relying upon, or the fuel system that we've been relying upon, is also phasing out. We need to start reducing that. We need to move into that direction. We need to, the reality of uh, floods in Europe, wildfires, Drought in Europe. Um, you know, in the 80s we lived in, the, in Europe. I never heard of drought in Europe. I always heard of drought in, in Africa. There's drought in Europe. I also heard of drought in the US those days. But drought in Europe, it's a new phenomenon. But it's becoming a reality. So those are some of the realities that we have to accept. Now, in, in terms of uh, moving our 
curriculum. We will continue to collaborate with the industry, improving on our curriculum. But you see, the, the reality that we also have is that we need to move and have this curriculum changed in a revolutionary fashion. We cannot have business as usual. We need to have, to have changes in terms of how we do a curriculum review. Mm -hmm. It cannot be said that uh, you only review it in after three years or five years. Curriculum with new developments, uh, with the new industries that we have now, the, 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 the hydrogen industry is coming on board. We need to change our curriculum as fast as we can. And I'm saying, but the levels at which we train are also low. We need to up. Our, our, our levels of training. We cannot continue training artisans, only artisans at the level of a certificate. Mm -hmm. We need to have technicians. Mm -hmm. Artisans are people who operate in, under supervision. Technicians have the ability to think slightly better than what artisans can do. And they actually relate to engineers. So that's the only reality. Now, if we want to have a so-called industrial industrialized, uh, society, we can only better, we need to change all the time as we are moving in, the, in terms of our economic trajectories, we need to move our curriculum in terms of technical education. South Korea has done that. I think Germany, it's, to them, is more of a tradition, but South Korea has been changing all their curriculum from 1962, in fact, way back, 53, 62, 79, uh, 82, recently 888, and then of recent, of course, it has been changing like on, an, on a yearly basis. So that's the reality of the economies that we are, we are moving into. That's what we need to move into as NTA and as Namibians in terms of changing our curriculum. In terms of the general education, we all emphasize on sub science subjects and all that. Mm -hmm. When we are looking at this that is confronting us, the hydrocarbon industry that we have as a, on our doorstep as, as an economy, the hydrogen industry that we have on our, on our doorstep as an economy, we just need uh, people in the sciences, the, particularly in the chemistry industry. We need to move into that area. I thank you so much. I know he's complaining. <laughs> <laughs> I hear Mr. Sirarika saying that the TV sector will be more responsive. I hear Mr. Sirarika saying that the TV sector needs to be more agile. Yep. And I think that is the message and the commitment that he's making. So the last question, and I think we need to give I need to finish the last question to Prof. The last question, please. <laughs> then, <laughs> just the last one. Uh, the one question that I want to ask, we hear time and again, the Green Hydrogen Project is our project. Um, and I hear a sense of pride and ownership of Namibians. And Prof, you've been speaking about collaboration um, and, and, and my question is really to say that it takes approximately four to eight years for engineers to complete mm. professional education, including undergraduate and graduate schools, because we are speaking about the revolution of skills. Hence, there is some risk of some shortage of, 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 of graduates. Um, but how do we balance uh, collaboration importing of skills and building local capacity because the fear that we always have is that foreigners will take our jobs. So how do we balance that, uh, Prof? And you have speaking loud and clear, collaboration, collaboration. And, and thank you for that. I think something that, 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 that um, he said, the previous panelist said before is, is very important in this, what I'm going to say now. Yes. Now, we have a lot of engineers who are unemployed. Right? Those figures that Dr. Olvo was showing was from 20, which year was that? Anyways, this year. 20. Okay. So if you look at NAST and UNAM both are training engineers, right? And how many are we actually graduating? How many of those engineers end up unemployed? How many of those engineers are actually going and studying education, which is another area because there are enough teachers, mm. right? So it's also saturated, that market. What do we do with the engineers who are currently on the street, who are telling you, what do I do? That, for us, is what we need to turn into an opportunity. So we don't need to go and retrain people 
you know, in the university, we simply upscale and reskill them. And why I'm saying something that he said is important is the technician and technologist level mm -hmm. for the engineers is missing. Yes. And, and, and even within government, we have to relook at the, um, the, the, the type of jobs that are available that we need to bring it back. We need to speak to the engineering, uh, um, what is it, the professional council. Yes. We need to see, sit down with them. This is what I mean about collaboration and see how do we address the shortages that we're seeing, how do we address the oversupply, the unemployment, how do we address the reskilling? I've seen that University of Stellenbosch has a good reskilling of engineers and upskilling school that in fact Roshpina Mine is making use of that to put their engineers through that retraining and, 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 and upskilling. Uh, but we need the professional bodies, we need the N NTA, we need the NQA, we need all of the players in the education sector to be on top of that. And where we do not have the skills, because there are some that we don't have, we have to send them elsewhere or have professors come here to come and help us build that skill. The chemical engineers I was talking about before, the ones at UNA, they were all trained in Japan, for instance. But we have them here right now, so let's see, how do we move forward? But everybody needs to come together and get that consensus and work with data as well that we'll get from the National Skills Audit that we'll undertake. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I wanted to say something, but I think the way Denver is looking, just, just one more. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And I, I hear collaboration in a very positive light. And I think that that's the way we need. And I hear that we need to break down silos. We need to start talking to one another. TVET sector and higher learning institutions, we need to find a career path that can really help us be becoming relevant. I just want to end with a quote that says that um, some see things as they are and say why. I dream of things that never were and say why not. And I think that is uh, why we are here this uh, these two days to say why not and give my brilliant panel another round of applause. That indeed was a brilliant panel. That indeed was a brilliant conversation. They do deserve another round of applause. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, I do not have a military background. So what I'm doing under duress induces a lot of trauma. I will need a lot of therapy, a lot of psychosocial support following this. But it's not necessary because you are here as a team and we need to be there for one another. It's been a powerful morning. There's a lot that we need to internalize. There's a lot that we need to reflect on, on account of the pressure on this precious commodity called time. We would only have had about 10 minutes to enjoy tea and to enjoy coffee and for a slight bit of networking. But on account of the quality audience that you are and that you continue to be, I have decided to display some sort of generosity, right? So I am going to give us 20 minutes. If you can have a look at any device that displays time in your possession, whether that is a wristwatch or a mobile device or any other device, mine states it's in the vicinity of almost 10 to 12 at the moment. Are you in agreement? In other words, we are starting no later than 10 past 12. We will start with or without you. So just remember that if the meeting has started, you're not allowed to have a separate convention elsewhere. So be there where you are, if that's the choice that you want to exercise, but you will not be allowed to convene there. If you're engaging, um, Her Worship the Mayor, Councillor Sade, Governor Savintuk, and you're Mr. Franschoff and Skalkwick from the NIPDB, uh, your worship, 
and he keeps on talking because he's, he's such a passionate individual. Kindly say to him, as your mayor, um, let's go inside because it's already almost 10 past and we don't want Denver to go locate that red tie in the car and put it on. Enjoy your tea. Thank you.
development of strategic key sectors of Namibia's economy, mining, fishing, agriculture, tourism, renewable energy. Namibia's vast renewable energy generation potential affords our generation with the opportunity to produce green hydrogen at unparalleled scales, thereby supporting our global objectives to decarbonize the planet. A prosperous and industrialized Namibia, developed by her human resources, enjoying peace, harmony, and political stability. Vision 2030. To achieve economic progression, social transformation, environmental sustainability, and good governance, the Namibian government is implementing the Harambe Prosperity Plan 2. HPP2 presents an opportunity to build on the legacy of the past three decades and guarantee a more secure future through resilient processes, systems, and institutions. The plan aims at implementing policy programs which enhance service delivery, private sector-led and inclusive economic growth. Namibia's diversification strategy is set to increase investment and development of the food industry, transport and logistics, metals, mining, renewable energy, chemical and basic materials, digital and global business services, and machinery and electronics. With the vision of private sector-led growth, Namibia is open to trade and foreign direct investment and is continuously proving to be the preferred investment location in Africa. Among the reasons for this include protection of ownership rights and rule of law, sophisticated financial systems, trade agreements that facilitate regional, continental and international market access, peace and stability. A nation powered by nature and fueled by hope. A nation where our unity is our strength where determination and passion endures. A nation powered by our unwavering belief in our values, our resources, and above all, our people. This is how we are shaping our future. Welcome to Namibia, the land of the brave. Tackling the challenge of climate change requires all of us. But business leaders have a unique responsibility to help the world transition to a lower carbon future. Are they up to the challenge? Are their organizations doing enough, quickly enough? What can we learn from the ones making a measurable impact? Deloitte questioned more than 2,000 CXOs to find out. We learned that most have been personally affected by extreme weather events and that our warming climate weighs heavily on their minds. Almost all said their companies have been impacted by climate change and there's pressure from their stakeholders to think long term and protect the planet. Most are taking action to combat climate change, but there's a disconnect between their ambitions and the actions they're willing to take cost and magnitude of the challenge have deterred many leaders from embedding sustainability into their core strategies and cultures. And many can't see the financial benefits of transforming their businesses. But some companies set themselves apart. About 20% of surveyed leaders said their companies have implemented four of five needle-moving actions defined by the study. They are developing new climate-friendly products or services, requiring suppliers and business partners to meet specific sustainability criteria, updating or relocating facilities to make them more resistant to climate impacts, incorporating climate considerations into lobbying and political donations, and tying senior leader compensation to sustainability performance. Statistically, this group of leaders expressed greater concern about the planet. Their companies are more likely to have aggressive net zero carbon emission targets, less likely to see expense and near-term priorities as obstacles, and more likely to understand the benefits of their efforts. Setting examples for all business leaders who embrace their responsibility to help protect the world for future generations.
Located on the west coast of southern Africa, Namibia has a population of 2.5 million people, occupying 824,292 square kilometer of breathtaking landscapes, home to abundant wildlife. Since its independence in 1990, Namibia has proven to be an African reference due to its political and economic stability, sustained by a flourishing democracy. Over the past 30 years, the country has seen the peaceful transfer of power of three presidencies. Namibia is a land of hospitable people with rich cultural traditions and exciting investment opportunities. Through the world-class port at Wolfish Bay, the country positions itself as a logistics hub for road, rail and sea freight, connecting neighboring countries and the broader Southern Africa development community with the rest of the world. Namibia, in reinforcing its strategic position of a logistical hub, continues to invest in infrastructural projects to facilitate easy access and movement of people and goods throughout SADC countries with a population of more than 300 million people and further access to the wider African market of 1 billion consumers through the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. The long-term economic and political strategy of growth is firmly based on ensuring openness to trade and external investment while advancing development of strategic key sectors of Namibia's economy. Mining, fishing, agriculture, tourism, renewable energy. Namibia's vast renewable energy generation potential affords our generation with the opportunity to produce green hydrogen at unparalleled scales, thereby supporting our global objectives to decarbonize the planet. A prosperous and industrialized Namibia, developed by her human resources, enjoying peace, harmony, and political stability. Vision 2030. To achieve economic progression, social transformation, environmental sustainability, and good governance, the Namibian government is implementing the Harambe Prosperity Plan 2. HPP2 presents an opportunity to build on the legacy of the past three decades and guarantee a more secure future through resilient processes, system, and institutions. The plan aims at implementing policy programs which enhance service delivery, private sector-led and inclusive economic growth. Namibia's diversification strategy is set to increase investment and development of the food industry, transport and logistics, metals, mining, renewable energy, chemicals and basic materials, digital and global business services, and machinery and electronics. With the vision of private sector-led growth, Namibia is open to trade and foreign direct investment and is continuously proving to be the preferred investment location in Africa. Among the reasons for this include protection of ownership rights and rule of law, sophisticated financial systems, trade agreements that facilitate regional, continental and international market access, peace and stability. A nation powered by nature and fueled by hope. A nation where our unity is our strength, where determination and passion endures. A nation powered by our unwavering belief in our values, our resources, and above all, our people. This is how we are shaping our future. Welcome to Namibia, the land of the brave. Tackling the challenge of climate change requires all of us. But business leaders have a unique responsibility to help the world transition to a lower carbon future. Are they up to the challenge? Are their organizations doing enough, quickly enough? What can we learn from the ones making a measurable impact? The Boy questioned more than 2,000 CXOs to find out. We learned that most have been personally affected by extreme weather events and that our warming climate weighs heavily on their minds. Almost all said their companies have been impacted by climate change and there's pressure from their stakeholders to think long-term and protect the planet. 
most are taking action to combat climate change, but there's a disconnect between their ambitions and the actions they're willing to take. The cost and magnitude of the challenge have deterred many leaders from embedding sustainability into their core strategies and cultures. And many can't see the financial benefits of transforming their businesses. But some companies set themselves apart. About 20% of surveyed leaders said their companies have implemented four of five needle-moving actions defined by the study. They are developing new climate-friendly products or services, requiring suppliers and business partners to meet specific sustainability criteria, updating or relocating facilities to make them more resistant to climate impacts, incorporating climate considerations into lobbying and political donations, and tying senior leader compensation to sustainability performance. Statistically, this group of leaders expressed greater concern about the planet. Their companies are more likely to have aggressive net zero carbon emission targets, less likely to see expense and near-term priorities as obstacles, and more likely to understand the benefits of their efforts setting examples for all business leaders who embrace their responsibility to help protect the world for future generations. Located on the west coast of Southern Africa, Namibia has a population of 2.5 million people occupying 824,292 square kilometer of breathtaking landscapes, home to abundant wildlife. Since its independence in 1990, Namibia has proven to be an African reference due to its political and economic stability sustained by a flourishing democracy. Over the past 30 years, the country has seen the peaceful transfer of power of three presidencies. Namibia is a land of hospitable people with rich cultural traditions and exciting investment opportunities. Through the world-class port at Wolfish Bay, the country positions itself as a logistics hub for road, rail, and sea freight, connecting neighboring countries and the broader Southern Africa development community with the rest of the world. Namibia, in reinforcing its strategic position of a logistical hub, continues to invest in infrastructural projects to facilitate easy access and movement of people and goods throughout SADC countries with a population of more than 300 million people and further access to the wider African market of 1 billion consumers through the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. The long-term economic and political strategy of growth is firmly based on ensuring openness to trade and external investment while advancing development of strategic key sectors of Namibia's economy. Mining, fishing, agriculture, tourism, renewable energy. Namibia's vast renewable energy generation potential affords our generation with the opportunity to produce green hydrogen at unparalleled scales thereby supporting our global objectives to decarbonize the planet. A prosperous and industrialized Namibia, developed by her human resources, enjoying peace, harmony, and political stability. Vision 2030. To achieve economic progression, social transformation, environmental sustainability and good governance, the Namibian government is implementing the Harambe Prosperity Plan 2. HPP2 presents an opportunity to build on the legacy of the past three decades and guarantee a more secure future through resilient processes, systems and institutions. The plan aims at implementing policy programs which enhance service delivery, private sector-led and inclusive economic growth. Namibia's diversification strategy is set to increase investment and development of the food industry, transport and logistics, metals, mining, 
renewable energy, chemicals and basic materials, digital and global business services, and machinery and electronics. With the vision of private sector-led growth, Namibia is open to trade and foreign direct investment and is continuously proving to be the preferred investment location in Africa. Among the reasons for this include protection of ownership rights and rule of law, sophisticated financial systems that facilitate regional, continental and international market access, peace and stability, a nation powered by nature and fueled by hope, a nation where our unity is our strength, where determination and passion endures. A nation powered by our unwavering belief in our values, our resources, and above all, our people. This is how we are shaping our future. Welcome to Namibia, the land of the brave. Tackling the challenge of climate change requires all of us. But business leaders have a unique responsibility to help the world transition to a lower carbon future. Are they up to the challenge? Are their organizations doing enough, quickly enough? What can we learn from the ones making a measurable impact? Deloitte questioned more than 2,000 CXOs to find out. We learned that most have been personally affected by extreme weather events and that our warming climate weighs heavily on their minds. Almost all said their companies have been impacted by climate change, and there's pressure from their stakeholders to think long-term and protect the planet. Most are taking action to combat climate change, but there's a disconnect between their ambitions and the actions they're willing to take. The cost and magnitude of the challenge have deterred many leaders from embedding sustainability into their core strategies and culture. And many can't see the financial benefits of transforming their businesses. But some companies set themselves apart. About 20% of surveyed leaders said their companies have implemented four of five needle moving actions defined by the study. They are developing new climate friendly products or services, requiring some suppliers and business partners to meet specific sustainability criteria, updating or relocating facilities to make them more resistant to climate impacts, incorporating climate considerations into lobbying and political donations, and tying senior leader compensation to sustainability performance. Statistically, this group of leaders expressed greater concern about the planet. Their companies are more likely to have aggressive net zero carbon emission targets, less likely to see expense and near term priorities and struggles, and more likely to understand the benefits of their efforts. Setting examples for all business leaders who embrace their responsibility to help protect the world for future generations. Fellow progressive and forward thinkers, fellow excellence practitioners, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed your extensive, elaborate, and comprehensive tea break. Uh, I hope you managed to score a business card or three. I hope that you managed to stretch your legs a bit, assimilate, internalize, digest the wealth of knowledge a bit. We slowly, slowly approach the end of the Namibia National Green Hydrogen Conference 2022, but not just, I want to appeal on everyone's patience, everyone's in indulgence, but very, 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 very seriously on everyone's compliance. As far as an early announcement is concerned about those human beings who endured torture at a particular gate, entrance and had their earthly possessions confiscated. It may be tricky for you, but there are items of value. You would know more than I do. 
those items are still in the possession of law enforcement. They have had to leave already. Some of them are staying behind to see to it that you come and claim your items. Is that very clear? If you are not going to be able to do so right away, for whatever reason, you will have to make arrangements or it's going to get super complicated. Not as complicated as green hydrogen, but super complicated. Is that very clear? All right. Cost. Who, will be, who will be responsible for what? I'm delighted to have a session as the first session under session six of the Namibia Green Hydrogen Conference 2022 called Tomorrow's Fuel Case Studies from Various Regions. Mr. Paddy Padmanathan, Vice Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Aqua Power. Director Nyom, Green Hydrogen Company, and Vice Chairman Zero BV. Mr. Pitt Manathan, did I do justice to, to your surname? Let's put our hands together for Mr. Paddy Pat Manathan. <laughs> you have a grand total of 10 minutes. I will try to do that. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Uh, well, well, good. Um, my privilege and pleasure to be here. Thank you very much to the organizers to, uh, for inviting me to say a few words. I'm really, really amazed at the number of participants and many of the, all of you distinguished participants who have come in, uh, uh, taken a huge interest in hydrogen and uh, are here. Uh, fantastic. I get to do this once in a while. Uh, I assure you. Different parts of the world. I shared a large sort of group and I saw that everybody is stuck in now for the second day. So fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege. And I will hopefully try and sort of do justice to the next seven or eight minutes. So um, I'm very aware that I'm probably preaching to the converted, but let me just sort of, I, I think it's extremely well worthwhile reminding ourselves where we are today. So where we are today. Energy and green hydrogen are now very much a competing value proposition. For a very simple reason, fossil f compared to fossil fuel generated electricity, certainly for the electricity that we consume during the times when wind and solar resources are available, there's no other way than wind and solar that you can generate electricity cheaper. And the difference is growing by the day. The gap between how low renewable energy versus fossil fuel based energy, that gap is widening. And 